of the directors of the Hudson Gateway Association of Realtors and the co-chair of our Global Business Council. And our mission is to provide our members with the tools and resources to connect globally with real estate professionals around the world. Uh, one of the ways we do that is through our innovative programming, like our Global Business Chat series, which is now in its third year. Uh, we don't focus on market statistics or real estate investment trends. We like to imagine our Global Business Chat as a little mini CIPS class, and we aim to provide important practical information about how a global real estate transaction works. To the extent that we can do that in one short hour, we explore the steps of the real estate transaction, the closing process, some of the unique legal or tax requirements that you should be aware of. Um, we've traveled to every continent over the last three years. Today, we're gonna do something a little bit different for the first time. We're actually going to Texas and we'll be joined by our guest, uh, Sogar Thomas Chapman, who is going to walk us through the process of the real estate transaction in Texas. But some of us may already be familiar with how a real estate transaction works in general, anywhere in the United States, but we're also gonna focus on what makes Texas such a huge magnet for foreign real estate investment. What's going on in Texas and how does it affect us as real estate professionals? So I want to uh, just begin by asking everyone to please turn off your phones, put your computers on mute. And if you can hold your questions to the end, we will have a question and answer session at the end of the presentation. So I'd like to welcome our guest, uh, Sokar Thomas Chapman. She is the former president or chairman, I believe you call, you refer to yourself as chairman of the uh, Austin Board of Realtors. She was a Realtor of the Year. She's a current director of NAR. She's a nationally recognized top producer and she is a fantastic realtor instructor and an active CIPS. So thank, uh, thank you so much, Sokar, for joining us. And please uh, take a moment to please introduce yourself. Just tell us a little bit more about your background to our okay. guests. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for having me, Tony. I am um, a realtor full-time. I was an engineer before, so I have a degree in electrical engineering. And about five minutes after I started working as an electrical engineer, I decided I don't like this. So I went, <laughs> I went back to school and um, studied real estate. And then I've been selling real estate in the Austin area for um, the last 20 years, um, over 20 years, 25 years, actually. So um, I, and I got my CIPS, um, gosh, about maybe six or seven years ago. And the reason, the main reason I got it was so that I could interact with other CIPSs around the world and um, to integrate uh, my real estate with my travel because I love to travel. I love, love, love it. Great, and I wanna definitely talk about your global network as well and how you make that work for your for your business. Uh -huh. uh, I, I wanna just get into a little bit about the real estate transaction in Texas before kind of shifting gears uh, and going in a different direction that we normally go on okay. this little program that we have. Um, and I want to have you explain to us a little bit about how the real estate transaction works in Texas. Because for example, in New York, I think it works a little bit different. In New York, yeah. for example, we must have an attorney present at the closing. Uh, so we're an attorney state. There are escrow states. I'm guessing that Texas probably falls into that latter escrow. category. Escrow, right? yep. Texas is an escrow estate. I have friends who work in Long Island and they work with Douglas Ellerman. And I've laughed at them. We've known each other for forever. And um, several of them um, on our mastermind calls would say, well, I guess it's not gonna close until January. And this would be like maybe October. And I'm like, how is it that you're gonna write a contract that doesn't close until January and you're writing it in October? And she explained to me about the attorneys getting involved in writing a binder and all of that stuff. And I was like, wow, in Texas, we are an escrow state. And that means that we, um, as, as licensees, as realtors, we have forms that we fill in the blanks and then we take it to the title company and the title company handles everything. The only attorney that is involved is someone, if someone wants their attorney 
to look at the documents that the contracts that we have created. Um, we don't create them actually, we just fill in the blanks, then they can. So the only attorney really involved is the attorney who draws up the documents for the title company. So we can conceivably write a contract today, fill in the blanks for our clients and have it closed by the end of the month. It's As really a recovering fast. attorney myself, uh, <laughs> I'm a little disappointed that you're trying to put the rest of us out of work. But <laughs> so, what, what, so basically you're working, you're working with, with contracts that are already approved, let's say by your, by your board. That and, is correct. By our really state. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and, our state has, um, our state has a broker lawyer committee that creates the contracts. They create them and then they send it to our licensing entity, which are our Texas um, real estate commission and they approve them. So we, everybody around the whole state of Texas uses the exact same contracts when they're selling residential and they work uh, created by attorneys and brokers together for the use of us as real estate professionals. And that's interesting. I mean, in New York, we have sort of a two ways that we do it. I mean, we have parts of, there's always an attorney involved, but uh, in parts of our state, we do have uh, contracts that we can use that are forms. Uh, uh -huh. But downstate, New York City, Long Island, Westchester, it's very, very, very different. What does that mean for the real estate transaction? Once you get an accepted offer on a property, okay, do you make your offer with, by submitting a signed purchase contract, for example? That's how we do it in upstate uh -huh. New York. Right. Yeah. So um, we have the forms and we um, fill them out, get the clients to sign it, DocuSign, and submit it to the seller. The seller says yes their agent gets them to DocuSign it. Then everybody sends it to the title company. Then the title company opens escrow, everything's deposited, everything is handled and coordinated at the title company. Great, so it's not like a memorandum, it's, it's the actual contract that is the offer. And when that mm -hmm. gets signed, then we have a deal. Then we have a deal, yeah. There, the only time there's changes, because Texas has what's called an option. It's a, it's a really weird thing. Um, Cause I tell all my friends in like California and different parts of the country. And they're like, what is this option period? Well, it's, we have an option to uh, the unrestricted right to terminate uh, based on however many days we filled in the blanks. So say we do a con uh, write a contract today is the third and we put seven days as our option period. The buyer pays the seller, um, you know, anywhere from 500 to a thousand dollars for that seven days that they take their house off the market. And then once they take their house off the market, the buyer can change their mind within those seven days for any reason whatsoever. I woke up, I have a headache. I don't want to buy the house. They, they get their earnest money back, but the thousand dollars that they paid for option money, the seller keeps it. And then the house goes back on the market. So, so that's very interesting because uh -huh, it's yeah. different. Is that different from, let's say, the inspection contingency? Is there a separate time period for doing that? That's, a, good, overlap? that's a great question, Tony. It, it, it's overlapping. Um, in that seven days, you need to get the house inspected and all of the, all of the repairs negotiated. So you get it inspected, um, say, on day two, and you find something wrong. Um, you can either extend it with an amendment uh, to extend that option period a few more days if you need to get some kind of um, some kind of bids for say foundation or roof roofing or plumbing or something like that some big major thing um, otherwise during that time frame we negotiate the um, we negotiate the fees we negotiate so, so that that option fee does that yeah. apply for the inspection period as well or is that only if I want to break the contract? for any reason and no reason. Okay, so the inspection period and the option period are usually around the same time. Once the option period is over, that's it. The only other time you can change your mind during that is if you don't get um, financing, if you're using, if you're doing financing. And the financing period is usually anywhere from about 14 to 21 days into the transaction. So if we get to date, 17 
and the buyer loses their job and the, the, you know, Wells Fargo does their final everything and go up, oh, they don't have a job. Then um, they're out of the contract because they can't buy the house because they don't have a job. Okay. And so if, if we do the inspection, right, and we have an inspection contingency, does the buyer still have to pay the option fee? Yes, they do. And so if, if something is wrong with the inspection, the roof is leaking or the foundation is sinking, they could they could pull out without losing their option. Earnest, fee. no, their, they they their lose earnest. their option money, but they keep their earnest money. I so they're separate. Mm -hmm. They're separate. And what 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 typically is the amount of an earnest deposit? Like for example, here in, in New York State, it could vary from you know five hundred dollars, you know, all the way up to let's say ten percent or whatever the buyer wants to put down, uh, depending on what part of the state you're in. But what about in Texas? What, what would the amount of the earnest deposit be? The earnest, um, and it's not anything required by the contract, it's whatever the seller and the buyer agree upon. And, um, but just as a matter of course, it's usually about 1% of the sales price. So if we're doing a $500,000, property, then it would be a $5,000 a $5, earnest money and $500 to $1,000 as, as uh, option money. Got it. Okay, super. And that's, that's interesting. That's definitely somewhat different from how we do things in, in New York because we have such a varied uh, amount as to what we could put down. And so, I believe you had a presentation that you wanted to share with us. Yes, it's just what a, yeah, it's a short um, presentation about um, why Texas? Why invest in Texas? And how awesome we are deep in the heart of Texas. So um, yeah, I'll right. I'll and I'd love to share that because I have some questions for you about Texas. So okay. it's not about cowboys or anything like that. <laughs> uh, but let's, if you could share your presentation, that would be great. Okay, cool. I'll, I'll share the screen now. Okay, so why invest in Texas? Hello, I'm Soccer Chapman Thomas. I am a native Texan, born and raised. I was born in um, Houston, Texas, born and raised, moved to Austin when I got married, and I've been a realtor ever since. Um, this is the, uh, these objectives is just to help realtors understand what transacting tax transacting business across national borders and to introduce agents to Texas real estate. And you may or may not know a little known fact about Texas is our Texas Realtors was named number one association for international training in 2012. And in 2020, the Austin Board of Realtors received a platinum award for our, um, our NAR, our global ambassador program. So in Texas, we, you know, we, I have a neighbor to the south of us, Mexico. And so the Texas Realtors is an NAR ambassador association with Mexico. And we're a part, we work very closely with AMPI. And AMPI is La, Asocia, uh, La Asociación Mexicana de Profesionales Inmobiliares. And so that's AMPI. And AMPI is like the NAR of Mexico. And Texas partners with um, our partnership encourages other realtors to form relationships across border. So why is Texas such a really awesome state for us to um, for for us to do international business? Well, glad you asked. We have a really super strong economy, Texas and entered 2021, even with the pandemic, we entered 2021 as the world's ninth largest economy by GDP. That's huge, huge. And um, where does that, how does that um, translate into real estate? Well, look at us, here we are, right in the middle of the country. Um, I was talking to Tony and everyone, um, when we started and I um, told them that I was gonna tell you something that makes Texas much different than any other state in the whole nation. 
And if you are from Texas and you know the answer and you're on this, do not answer this question. This is only for the people who are not from Texas to answer this question. What, what makes Texas different as it relates to flags in the United States? What can we do that no other state can do? Well, I will tell you, we are the only state in the nation that can fly our flag at the same level as the national flag. So Texas's flag is never subservient, is never lower than the United States flag. That was one of the agreements that was made when Texas rejoined the union. They said, Texas, the great state of Texas will never be a, a subordinate to anyone else. Even the United States is because we used to be our own country. We are so proud of that. I know it's crazy. And, <laughs> and at all of our meetings, this is gonna sound weird. And in the schools, we say the Texas pledge, honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas one state under God, one and indivisible. Yeehaw! I mean, <laughs> that's our state. That's our state. Is that plan. yeehaw included in the no, yeehaw? no. <laughs> the yeehaw is my yeehaw from um, <laughs> from Mipham. I went to Mipham, which is the international, the largest international uh, real estate conference. It happens every year in March in um, in two thousand and nineteen, and I added the yeehaw because I I uh, gave a lot of the a lot of the attendees Texas state um, pins. So our forecast, look at us, here's Texas right in the middle. And Tony asked me if Texas was close to California. Since I just drove from Texas to California, I would say it's not that close. Um, our foreign born population, we have almost 5 million people who were born in other countries that live in Texas, almost 8 million people in our state speak Spanish and over a million people speak um, a language other than English and Spanish in our nation, in our, in our, in our country, in our state, <laughs> in our state. So um, the, the other two largest languages are Vietnamese and um, dialects from uh, India. So um, this is where our um, international uh, information of where people come from in, um, let's see, that one's, what is that one? What are the driving um, destinations? Why do people choose Texas? Why is Texas so, um, why is Texas so appealing to everyone? It's its proximity to everywhere. So if you, if we go back a slide, you see where we are? Texas is in the middle of the country, basically. It's easy for us to get over here. It's easy for us to get over there. We have major international airports. We have Houston International Airport. We have Dallas, DFW. Uh, Houston is the hub for United Airlines. Dallas is the hub for American Airlines. Houston, HOU, Hobby is the hub for Southwest Airlines. And we have um, Austin Bergstrom International Airport, San Antonio International Airport, and El Paso. So all of these airports can get us from here and there and all around the world. Um, Texas is ranked as one of the best places to work. This is where our foreign buyers come from. We are number three in the nation as far as um, foreign buyers purchasing property in the state of Texas. These numbers all across the board are down by a little bit simply because of the pandemic of last year. And these numbers were given to us by um, chief economist, um, Mr. Jung, Lawrence Jung, um, and these numbers are hot off the press. So our numbers slipped a bit. It used to be about 12% and now it's at 9% because if I, COVID. Can, if I can ask a question about that, because I had mm -hmm. a couple other statistics, you know, one that says that uh, the United Kingdom, Japan, and France have created the most, uh, their companies have, have the largest number of jobs provided in the state of Texas, of global employers, the, 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 of the biggest global employers in Texas. Uh, the most jobs are coming from 
British, Japanese, and French companies. And another statistic that I had was that over 666,000 workers in Texas are employed as a result of global investment in your state. So why is it that, in your, in your opinion, that we have 9% of all foreign buyers going to Texas, which is more than double of what we're seeing in New York or New Jersey or even Arizona? Um, it's the business environment, number one. Um, we have really great schools, health. Um, the nine super, um, I think I have a slide on here. The super, te um, the, the, the growth, the GDP, we have the super sectors. We have business services, education and health, leisure and hospitality, manufacturing, financial services, construction and energy. And I think that I think that most people go to Texas because of their companies. Okay, we have Samsung. Um, as you know, I have a Samsung phone. I'm one of those people. Um, and Samsung has the only wafer fab outside of Korea is in Austin, Texas. So we have lots of, of companies that are like that, that are building and bringing people to this, um, to this state. Um, our state also has you know, the energy sector. We produce more natural gas than anybody else in the whole world. Um, and we also are really, I think the last time I checked, we were number one, kind of slipping back and forth between producing the most oil. So we have a really huge, huge um, group of, of um, growth um, sectors here. Um, our, our, our manufacturing, we have the wafer fab here. We have Tesla. Um, Tesla is building a massive uh, manufacturing plant in Austin, Texas, um, in, in um, where's healthcare? In healthcare, healthcare in Houston, Texas, the, the medical center in Houston, Texas, the Texas Medical Center is world renowned. We have the DeBakey Center, the guy who did the first heart transplant and all of that stuff. We have uh, Texas Children's Hospital, which, which uh, rivals all other hospitals as far as medical uh, procedures. And people come from around the world to the state of Texas for health. In education, we have Rice University. That's my alma mater in Houston, Texas. UT, the Longhorns. You'll never see me do this any other time because I'm a Rice owl. Um, UT Longhorns here. We have a and We have Baylor. We have all of these education. We have business services. We have a lot of call centers here. Leisure. We love our fun in Texas and we're huge. So we have stuff. We have everything from going to um, going to Big Bend, which kind of mimics or looks a little bit like um, like the uh, Grand Canyon to going down to the coast and surfing in, um, in Corpus Christi. So we have a whole bunch of stuff here. <laughs> uh, the, our construction, you had another question, Tony? Yeah, I, I had one sort of nuanced question. So, you know, according to NAR, 35% of Texas immigrants are from Asia. So that, that's an interesting statistic. Um, does that, are, are they, are they coming because of schools? Are they coming because of jobs? Are they coming because of these specific com companies from their countries that are opening up the semiconductor uh, manufacturing facilities? It's yes there? to all of the above. It's yes to all of the above. The, um, there are a lot of families that are here and they're bringing families here. The um, cost of living in Texas, um, take Austin out of the picture because our cost of living is, you know, our housing is really, really um, way up there, but we're the San Francisco of Texas. But if you take Austin out of the picture, the housing in Texas is very, very affordable. Um, the, the, how, the average house in the state of Texas, if you don't use the numbers in, in Austin, would be around 270 to 280,000. So less than $300,000 will get you a brand new house in most parts of the state of Texas. In Austin, not so much, but um, in most of the state of Texas. So it's a really 
awesome, awesome deal. And a lot of families come because of the education, the schooling. Um, in Texas, we do have this rule that if you are, um, if your child um, graduates from high school and they are in the top 5% of their high school, they are automatically, automatically accepted into any of the state schools like Texas A&M, UT, all of the schools that are state run schools. So that's another reason. So if you have kids that are bright and brilliant and they come to Texas and they do really well in school and they graduate in the top 5%, you really don't have to worry about where they're going to college because they already have automatic admissions into the, um, wow, some of the state impressive. universities. Yeah. Impressive. And I, I want to go back to something you said about affordability because I know this particular conversation that we're having is a little bit different than the one we normally have because mm -hmm. we're focused on a country that we're not maybe so familiar with and we don't know what the legal process is. I mean, we're still in America here. I know Texas is its own country, but you mentioned affordability. And one of the things that I, I want to talk about is in terms of affordability, if somebody's looking to invest in Texas or just move to Texas, what are the property taxes like? How do they compare to states this. like New York or New Jersey where they're very high? And what's okay. the return on your investment if you want to buy a rental property? Are there any issues when it comes to uh, rent regulation or if we have to evict tenant, not paying tenants. What, tell us a little bit about that. Okay. So in Texas, we, one of the things that people like and businesses as well is we have no state income tax. There are zero state income tax, but our property taxes kind of mimic state income taxes because our property taxes are anywhere from 1.5 to 3% per year. That's the, that's the average um, property taxes. And there's no restrictions on people buying properties in the state of Texas for investment. There's no restriction on how many you can have. Um, if you want to buy 20 properties and make them all rental properties, you can do that. The only thing that you can't do, and, and it depends on the cities, sometimes people want to do Airbnbs in different parts instead of just doing straight rentals. There are different um, rules about that, uh, depending on what mun municipality you're in. But as far as just buying rental property and owning it, you can do that all day. There's no restriction. I see, great, that's interesting. And, and I mean, do you find, what, what does this do for your business? As, a C, as someone who has a CIPS designation, someone who, works with other uh, agents from around the world who loves to travel, being that, that Texas is so centrally located and has so much going for it in terms of its diversity and the businesses that are coming in from all around the world, how do you expand your global business network? And how do you expand your business? Um, one of the things that I do is I automatically, every time I go to any place, whether it's uh, a Long Island, New York, or um, uh, Zanzibar, uh, Tanzania, I look up a real estate professional. Everywhere I go, in every city that I visit, I always take at least one day and I make contact with somebody who sells real estate in whatever city I'm in, in whatever part of the world I find myself in. That is how I grow my global network. So I have people that I talk to, you know, once a quarter or so on WhatsApp or now with Zoom, um, we'll just do a Zoom call. Hey, how are you? How are things going there? And, and I do that so that they can see my face so that we can maintain our connection so that when they hear somebody going, Texas, you know, they think of me and I tell them I'm your Texas contact. Now I sell real estate in central Texas in the Austin area, but they don't know that. I mean, I my license allows me to sell throughout the whole state. And so what I do is I act as a facilitator for people from around the world. And if they need a great agent in Dallas, I'm going to call some of my um, fellow CIPS people or friends or, or other realtors um, in that I know that are in, in education, that are leaders, that are still producing realtors, and I connect them. What do I get for that? Zero. I get goodwill. That's what I get. So I want to be the connection 
for the rest of the world for all things real estate in the state of Texas. And that's what I tell them. I'm your Texas connection. And I take around my little Texas pick. Texas pins, it's a realtor Texas pin and I give it to people and they're just like, oh, they love the little Texas pin because, you know, our state is a is a, a really cool shape. I mess with um, Charlie Oppler, our current NAR president. When we were in, in MIPM, um, everybody was coming to the Texas booth because Texas. And Charlie Oppler came over and he's like, why are all these people here, soccer? And I said, all the people are here because of Texas, Charlie. And he said, you're handing them those pins. And I said, of course I am. They want a pin because it's Texas. And he went back to the Jersey, the New Jersey booth. And he's like, we need to get pins. And I was like, Charlie, nobody knows the shape of New Jersey. What is it like a parallelogram? Or, and he was like, shut up, soccer. <laughs> So that's our inside joke. Anything that's shaped like Texas, I send him a picture of it and he's like, I'm so tired of Texas. I think New York is shaped a little like Texas. I don't know. We're going to get our own pins from IFA. <laughs> You're going to get your pins. Yeah. Because he's like, <laughs> We're going to get your pins. And soccer, you know, we, we talked about the statistics, but, and now you're talking about your global network. So people who are calling you, where are they calling you from? Where are they coming from? Are, I mean, we, we tend to think, okay, well, Texas is right just north of, of Mexico. So presumably most of your, your foreign investors are coming from Mexico. Um, but what where are they coming from, from your experience? From my experience, I have clients from Iran. I have clients from Senegal. I have clients, of course, from Mexico. That one is, is an easy one. Um, uh, clients from Canada, clients from England, clients from um, China. So China, England, those are, those are where all of the majority of mine, Senegal, uh, Mexico, China, Iran, and England. That's where the majority of mine uh, are coming from. And their purpose for coming to Texas, is it for a second home, a vacation home? Is it for, are they being transferred? What, what, what's the mindset behind some of these? Uh, um, uh, uh, about half of them already have family here. So they're coming to be near family. Uh, and then the other part is for uh, transfers with companies. Got it. Okay. And, and so tell us a little bit about your involvement with, with MIPM, because one of, the things that, uh, one of the things that we did a couple of years ago was to go to MIPM for the first time. Uh, the too. Gateway Association of Realtors. Uh, New York State, of course, has a, a booth. But tell us, as, a, as a, someone who has a CIPS designation, and someone who's involved in a uh, Texas realtor organization that's very involved globally, um, how does that help your business and why is it important? What would you say are the one or two most important things for someone to do who is a CIPS designee and who wants to grow their global business? Oh my goodness. Um, MIPM was the best eye-opening experience that I've ever had in any um, real estate conference that I've ever attended. It's fast paced, but it is so phenomenal. You have more, almost 30,000 real estate professionals from around the world and people are meeting and talking and you're making contacts. I have WhatsApp conversations with people that I haven't done business with yet, but I met them at MIPM, a guy in Dubai. He, um, he uh, is the manager for um, all of the new, um, if you look at Dubai, you see that they're creating like islands and he is the manager. We were just standing in line and I told him that he smelled nice. And he was like, how do you know what cologne this is? I said, I'm just that person. I just, my nose knows sense. And so we started talking and um, we, we still, we WhatsApp each other. And he said, you know, I need to, I need help um, telling people about uh, Dubai and about what we're doing. And I said, well, once you get uh, more of your, of your properties built, I will come to Dubai and go and look at it. And he's like, I would love to host you. So you, you bump into people in line, you, um, you have the opportunity to network and talk to people and, and trade cards and be a part of the global real estate world. Because he told me, I want you to be my Texas connection. I'm like, awesome. I'm your Texas connection. And if you have any questions, 
you know, and you need somebody in New York. Now I know Tony or, you know, whomever we just, we just connect people. It's, it's the best way to grow your global network. It might seem really wild to go outside of the country, never being before, never having gone there, but it was the best time. And I was so sad that it was canceled last year, but I understand it was canceled because of COVID, but I'm going next year. I'm going. I've already uh, made my my hotel reservations and my plane uh, reservation, uh, plane tickets, and I just need to get my um, my ticket. So I'm already going to MIPA. So it's it's it is so important for growing your global network to go out and go to different conferences. It's the networking aspect of it. Right, and that's what this is also part of. I mean, we want to introduce. Um, you know, members of our association, members of our region, uh, to other professionals from around the country and around the world so that we can expand our network. One of the things that we're going to be doing, uh, we're going to be continuing with our global, uh, global summit, global real estate summit on September 30th. It's actually going to be uh, the next day after C5. So if anyone okay. here is going to C5, September 27th, 28th, and 29th, if you want to spend an extra day you can attend our Global Real Estate Summit. We've been doing it for, this will be our 15th year. Wow. And for the, uh, I think this is the second or third year in a row that we were actually doing it on a regional basis. Um, it used to be an event that was sponsored by one or two associations, Manhattan, Staten Island. Uh, we're now doing it with Long Island Board of Realtors, Greater Bergen Association of Realtors. So we're a total of about seven uh, regional realtor associations that are putting this together. And together we probably represent the largest concentration of realtors in the country. Uh, oh, nice. Doing this. So we're, we're growing our, our uh, base and we're trying to build on C5 and get, get some of that excitement to come to, our, uh, to come to our event. So hopefully if we don't see you this year, we'll see you next year. But I, I think I think I'll try to come on I'll look at my schedule. I might you can see come you. and give Charlie <laughs> Opera another pin. I think yes. <laughs> I know. Give him another pin. He's like, oh my God, there she is again with right. these dang pins. <laughs> and so I, I wanted to bring uh, we have Christine Wren with us. Uh -huh. And and she was nice enough to introduce you to us. And I wanted to just bring her online for a moment, because I wanted to talk to her a little bit about why global is so important for your association and what you're doing to, as part of your global business council, to spread the word about CIPS and global and why it's so important. Well, hello, Tony. Hello, Soccer. Um, soccer is our great representation. She is feet on the ground around the world. She's the real deal. Um, we love having her on our global ambassador team. Um, for those who don't know, um, Austin Board of Realtors does not have a global committee. We have a global advisor group. Um, when the Austin Board of Realtors changed their format a few years ago and um, really restructured some of the governance here. So we have a five person global advisory group. Soccer is one of our global ambassadors uh, to Africa. And I'm really excited that NAR is actually going to have a class on the whole continent that's going to be coming out soon, we hope. I think I heard it's been delayed just a little bit this fall, um, but we'll definitely be bringing that on board. And then we have a global business alliance, which is our network group here. Um, and we have about 500, 500 uh, members or so that are interested um, they get the newsletter that are part of the networking opportunities that want to be on the forefront of programs like this. I absolutely love this anatomy of a sale program that you've been doing. Um, when I first saw it, I told Kathleen, this was exactly the type of programming we're trying to bring to our members in Texas and central Texas here. So uh, that's just a little bit about Austin and, and our kind of levels of getting involved in global programming here. Great. Thank you so much for connecting us. And, and actually, our uh, Global Business Council co-chair, Emmy, is here. And maybe yeah. if Emmy can unmute herself, because now we've got two global ambassadors here. And maybe, you know, Emmy and Soccer can share some ideas of what you're doing as global ambassadors that can help our members and our real estate professionals grow their, their global business. So, uh, yes. Hi, everybody. I am... Um... 
I'm a co-chair of the Global Business Council for HEAR along with Tony. And um, it's a pleasure to have Sokar here as uh, it's just, it has been a blast listening to you. <laughs> and yes, uh, I really, really enjoy it. And um, I'm a global ambassador for um, NAR for Argentina, Uruguay, and Paraguay. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, as, as Sokar was saying, every time we travel, uh, we make room to connect, to connect to with other realtors. We usually, what I do personally, I just have my agenda along with the family agenda, of course. Mm -hmm. And, but we just squeeze in one or two, a coffee, or, uh, you know, just a little hello. Um, we look for other CIPS, definitely, uh, because we do uh, believe we are on the same page. We respect the same code of ethics. Um, we had been trained and, and specialized in global real estate. And so we basically know that the client that we may refer one day will be um, treated with the same respect and the same professionalism as we will be treating that client ourselves. So we know that the client will be in great hands on the other side. Um, so that's basically what we, what we do generally. In regards to our countries, we are there to assist them in any way we can. Um, they have their own objective, they have their own goals, where they want to take their own associations. And so we are there to support them and, and to help them in, in, in any way. Um, some of them are developing an MLS. In some countries, the MLS does not exist. Some of them, they want to just showcase the country itself. Uh, we just did um, a trade mission to Paraguay, which was a success. We have um, more than 100 people um, wow. assisting there. Um, we have training programs that we share and we do webinars with them. So, and that also helps creating this, uh, building this bridge among different cultures. Mm -hmm. uh, we do the same thing when we travel to Mipin. Mipin is a great place to go, um, definitely a place to go. And so uh, I'm having uh, that cup of coffee with you in Cannes for sure. Um, but uh, we, you know, those are different places are where you want to go. As a realtor, you want to connect. And you will be the connector between clients and uh, properties. And sometimes people with people, we are, we are in the middle. And we want to make sure that we have the tools that um, we need to be able to be professionals and successful in our business. And Sucker, if, I know if you could tell us like just a minute of what you're doing as global ambassador. I got very excited here because we've got Christine and Emmy and you, and and, uh, and I definitely wanna be able to, to grow our collaboration uh, going, going forward with between New York, New Jersey, Texas, um, and our business council. But Sucker, if you could tell us a little bit about what you're doing as global ambassador, and then I wanna let you get back to Texas because, okay. <laughs> because I, you know, we have so many things to talk about with you, but, but I do want you to, get back to Texas. Okay, so as global ambassador to Africa, I have connections all around the continent because Africa is really huge. And just recently, one of my clients and friends went back home to Senegal. And while she was there, we did a, um, we did a Zoom call and, and we brought on some of the real estate professionals in the Senegal area. And they showed me um, properties that were available and pictures and the proximity to the ocean and all of that. So I make, I, even though I'm not there physically, I am, um, I go um, virtually, but in the next six months, I'm going to be there physically. I haven't been there physically for about three years. Um, I was going to go um, with uh, my client to Senegal, uh, but something, you know, family stuff happened. So I couldn't go this time, but I'm going to go with her in six months. And we're going to go look at Senegal, Ivory Coast, Sierra Leone, um, and uh, Ghana. And we're going to look at real estate. I'm going to have some fun, of course, and then look at real estate and make connections there. So I physically like to go, but when I can't go, 
um, just make connections with CIPSs around the world and say, hey, let's do jump on a Zoom call. I want to ask you some questions about real estate. And you ask questions and they answer them. And then, you know, you can set up some kind of virtual uh, um, connection with people. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh. So I'm uh -huh. glad that we got uh, a chance to talk a little bit about that aspect of your career and also to chat with Christine a little bit. Um, but I want you to go back to Texas because I, I want to definitely continue with your, your presentation. I want to make sure that we get that all in. Okay. All right. Cool. We'll go back to Texas real quick. And, and I just have a few more slides because I know we want to leave enough time for people to ask, to ask questions. And so um, these are some of the companies, um, HP, Dell, IBM, Google, Cisco. We have um, Facebook, Applied Materials, AMD. We have Emerson, Samsung, Ericsson, Texas Instruments, uh, Fujitsu, uh, Nokia, Toyota. Toyota just built a humongous um, um, plant in the Plano area. We have Apple who just bought over 4,000 acres of land to build the largest Apple uh, campus outside of Cupertino in Austin, Texas. Peter built GM, Lear, um, Victory Climate Systems. Um, we have of the energy sector, of course, BP, Valero, Philips, Exxon Mobil, um, um, Chevron, Tesoro, Marathon Oil, Dow Chemicals, Houston, where I'm from, just a little bit um, east of Houston, we have a whole, whole lot of manufacturing in Pasadena, Texas, um, a lot of chemical manufacturing, DuPont, Dow, Dow, um, all kinds of, of um, plastics and um, chemical manufacturing in Houston. Uh, we have skilled labor in the state of Texas. So we have very, uh, a very um, uh, educated labor force. So these are some of the schools that I was telling you about. We have um, Rice, I put Rice right in the center, right? Um, <laughs> Rice University, Texas uh, UT, uh, Texas SMU, UT Dallas, Texas Tech, U of H, University of uh, State, um, Texas State University, A&M, UNT, and our community college. Our community college, um, um, uh, cooperation is really huge in the state of Texas. Houston Community College and Austin Community College are the two largest ones. And they um, educate probably, I would say half of, um, not half, but at least a third of the people who come to UT and Rice and um, U of H and A&M at, at their second year from their junior year on, they started all of their um, basic courses at ACC or Houston Community College. Because sometimes parents, if their kids didn't get a, um, a scholarship, right? They're like, I don't wanna pay all of this money for you to go to UT. I want you to get all of your core, uh, all of your core education done first. And then I will send you to the big university. So if you go to Houston Community College or to Austin Community College, you can, all of those credits can transfer into the university and, and then you finish your last two years at the university. So that happens a lot in the state of Texas. So that's pretty good. So um, we people come to the United States for, uh, come to Texas for our um, education a lot. So I think that's, you know, these are just other little things about it and, and talking about earning your, your CIPS and that sort of stuff. So um, that's it. That's about the size of it. And um, I'll leave it open for questions. So I have one question. I mean, we have people from India and China and Mexico. Do you notice a shift in where the investment is coming from? Um, we did see a lot more coming from um, Canada, um, um, but India, China, in, in uh, Texas, we have India, China, and um, Vietnam, 
Mexico and Canada. Those are places I think we have seen more in Canada. Come this way. Mm -hmm. And if anyone else has any questions, uh, please feel free to uh, either post it in the chat or feel free to, to speak up. And if they'd like to speak live, they can also raise their hand. Uh, somebody in the chat said that's what they did with their, um, they took all of their classes at, um, uh, Kathy said, that's what I did. I took a lot of my basic classes at Pan and Pan Am and SAC and then went to the university. That happens all the time and in Texas and all around the country because it, it's a great value to, um, to go to school at the university, at the community college and then go move up to the, the larger university. Are you finding that, uh, and maybe you have less experience with this, but uh, in when that, where I went to, to college, we had a lot of foreign students who would stay, choose to stay in the United uh -huh. States. I had a lot of friends in New York, for example, who went to university with me in Illinois and they stayed in Illinois. Uh, uh -huh. I don't know why they didn't come back to New York, but they, you know, they stayed in Illinois for a variety of reasons. You know, you finding that, that a lot of students are doing this. Um, they're coming to Texas and they're staying in Texas. The answer is yes. Um, a lot of students stay in Texas. I have several um, friends who um, immigrated here. They, their kids were still at home. They brought them here and now they're staying um, at home. They are, they are from Vietnam and now they're staying here in Texas. They came here to go to school and now they're staying. They are getting married, having children. They're, they're remaining. Yeah, so we're seeing that a lot. Great, and someone, uh, Kathy Bombush asked a question. Uh, there are a lot of students from Peru at St. Mary's University, I'm assuming you're- That's in San Canada. Antonio, uh-huh. Um, and I mean, do you find a lot of other, uh, a lot of other groups from other countries, Latin American countries besides Mexico that are coming to live or work in Texas? Any particular countries in South um, Central America? Um, Honduras, um, Belize, um, Peru, of course, um, Venezuela. And Venezuela. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's interesting because you find a lot of Venezuelans going to Florida, but they're also coming to, to Texas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Florida, Texas, and um, California are the top three in the nation for, um, for uh, foreign, uh, for immigration. Mm -hmm. And you know Texas and um, California, you can see because Mexico's right there, right? But um, Fl um, Florida people come from Cuba and different parts of the world. I mean, we're we're the three. How many? How many are New York transplants? I don't know. <laughs> a lot more. <laughs> I can tell you, I have quite a few clients, <laughs> uh, friends, and clients who've made the uh, the switch to Texas. <laughs> over the last several years. Okay, well, good. If they're looking for Austin, I'm here. <laughs> we, we, do have a, we do have a question. Okay. Um, are there any restrictions on purchasing farms slash ranches? Nope. You want some? We got some. Nope. You can buy them. There's no restrictions. The only restriction is your pocketbook. As my grandmother would say, pocketbook. Who says that? But old people do. So, um, the um, pocket, but your your what you can afford is the is it yeah. Oh yeah, and there are a lot of consulates in Houston. I used to go, when I grew up in Houston. I think um, someone said that when I grew up in Houston, I used to go by all the consulates. I should have known I was going to be involved in anything international because my whole life I've been I've been curious and interested in countries all around the world, and I blame it on my mom because she was a school teacher and. Um, every summer from sixth to ninth grade, we did this uh, project called People and Places Around the World. And so for six weeks, we would go to um, uh, this elementary school and they would do different, uh, different, war different countries. And they introduced us to the culture, to the food, to the dress, little songs, all kinds of stuff. So uh, my mom was prepping me early on for international travel. Thank you, mom. <laughs> pre-CIPS. Yes, pre-CIPS. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, that's it. Perfect. <laughs> we had one, and I know we're running out of time, but we actually have uh, an interesting question here uh, that I heard through the grapevine that they were giving away uh, Texas land to people to grow hemp or cannabis. Is that something that you've heard of, or is, is the cannabis industry something that's growing? Okay, so right now in the state of Texas, let's get that one clear. We do not, um, we are not, um, cannabis has not been approved for medicinal purposes yet. Hemp, um, people are growing hemp though, um, and, and they're using a lot of hemp products. But right now in the state of Texas, we have not legalized cannabis yet, not even for medicinal purposes. So the only thing we have is like CBD oil and stuff like that. Yeah. But we, yeah, um, I think we'll probably legalize gambling first before we legalize, <laughs> before we legalize cannabis. <laughs> right. Interesting. Interesting. Well, soccer, I want to give you the last word because we are running out of time. I want to tell you, it's been so fun having you uh, today. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to encourage you to go outside of your comfort zone, go someplace that you've never been before and meet some real estate people, have a great time, enjoy the culture, get your CIPS and sell a bunch of real estate to a bunch of people. So I, I'm, I'm here for, like I said, I left my information. Anytime you have any questions, just give me a call. Thank right. you. It's Who been my pleasure. The NAR convention. Yes. Oh, always at the NAR convention. I've been at every NAR convention since uh, 1999. Super, super. Hope to see you there. I hope to see, I you, see there. you there. Thank you. Well, well thank you for joining us, everyone. I want to uh, just remind you that we're going to be having our Global Real Estate Summit on September 30th at the Marriott Marquis Hotel in Manhattan. Uh, we'll be joined by uh, several other real estate, regional real estate associations. I believe we're also going to be having a, um, a delegation from Texas. Thank you, Christine, for that. And um, what I want to also remind you of is that we will be having uh, additional global business chat programming in December and in October. Dates are yet to be determined, but we'll be focusing on Australia and Ghana. So hopefully you'll join yes. us then. We will be putting more information on our website. Um, and uh, Kathleen Stack, I think, had put the link to our website in the chat. So if you want more information, you can go there and get it. And hopefully we'll see you then. Okay. I'll see you then, guys. Thank you so much. Have a great you're welcome. Thanks, Bye. Dr. Great pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you.